Uh, and now we'll start this evening, a brief introduction to John Hooper, um, a friend and uh, regular here. Um, John was educated at the University of Cambridge, where he's recently been made an honorary fellow at his college, St. Catharines, which is a huge honor. Congratulations on that, John. Um, and he, whilst he was still an undergraduate, he went off on his first journalistic assignment, I think, to Nigeria and Biafra, if I remember correctly. So he was um, a pup journalist before he'd even finished his university and has gone on to become um, a highly respected uh, journalist for The Guardian, The Wall Street Journal, and now particularly The Economist. A lot of time in uh, Spain, other parts of Europe, but also a lot of time in Italy. So that, that's John, and we're delighted to have you back. Um, I want to... Thank you, Simon. Allora, comincio in italiano perché stasera parliamo degli italiani. Così voglio sapere se ci sono per caso alcuni italiani qua con noi. Oh, sì, uh, mi temevo che sarà la possibilità. <laughs> um, so, because um, John, aided and abetted by me, is now take, going to take a risk, which is to talk about the Italians. Uh, um, and I'm, I'm minded as, as we get into this of um, the uh, famous book by Luigi Bazzini, written I think in the 60s, maybe the 70s, and certainly which I read when I was first living here 45 years ago. Um, and I thought it was great because it told me all sorts of interesting um, family secrets. The room at the time was that. Um, Bazzini received a lot of uh, criticism from his fellow Italians for spilling the beans and uh, uh, letting out far too many secrets uh, for the um, delight and erudition of, of the international world. So um, uh, some 40, 40 odd years later, uh, John Hooper uh, had the same temerity. So uh, John, you know, what, what was it the book first brought you to Italy that gives you the credentials to do this? Uh, what actually very first brought me to Italy uh, was, I, I entered Italy as a criminal, actually. Um, this is just between us. There's no <laughs> list um, I was actually uh, recruited by a German to work uh, on his yacht, brewing the yacht. And um, while we were at sea in the Mediterranean, uh, I asked him what was in the hold. And he said, mustard. Um, but don't tell anybody about it because we're smuggling the mustard. Um, he said that he'd been uh, moored in the Rhone River in France uh, at Dijon and that he had somebody staying on the, uh, the boat and he'd been paying his rent in stolen mustard. And I believed all of that um, for a while. Um, and um, it was actually when I saw him pass an envelope to somebody at the first Italian port where we uh, birthed that I began to think that maybe it wasn't mustard in the hold and that I could actually spend the rest of my life in prison because of what probably was in the hold because we were bound for Turkey and then Lebanon. And so I jumped ship. Um, I think we were smuggling arms to Kurdish rebels and then probably narcotics to somewhere else. Anyway, um, I jumped ship and that's how I came to Italy. That was the very first time when I was 18 years old. I came back as a, um, as a correspondent in the 1990s, um, but um, with a brief to cover the whole of something. This was for The Guardian. And so I spent uh, four, four and a half years here, based here, but traveling from all the way from, from Portugal across to uh, Turkey and spending a large part of the latter part of my assignment in the Balkans. Uh, and then I came back um, quite by coincidence because I was posted by the Guardian to Berlin. And I thought really that's the end of my connection with Italy at the time. Um, and then various things happened, and I came back in uh, 2003 for The Economist. That's, that's really the, the story of it. And this time I came back actually with a brief to cover Italy and the Vatican, no more. And um, 
And it was at that point that I started to think that maybe I could do what I'd done in, in uh, Spain to write a book about the Italians instead of the Spaniards. And um, I, I tried, and, and it's an interesting question because I did try uh, and felt that I couldn't do it. For a long time, I felt that Italy was playing too many surprises on me. You know, Italy is a country in which what you get on the surface is not what you get underneath. And I was frequently tricked on things, so one of them I recount in the book. Uh, and I decided to leave it and then leave it again. And it was only when I, those surprises started to fade away that I actually felt, yes, now I think I, I know enough about the country that I'll, I'll give a go, I'll give it a stand. Mm. But I mean, is it really possible to write a book that uh, describes who a nation is, who a people are? No. Um, no, it's a stupid enterprise, really. Um, you, um, and particularly in Italy, say, because it's such a diverse country. I mean, what is true of Calabria is not true of, of Piedmont. You know? uh, it's a country that was you know, lashed together in the 1860s, 1870s, uh, out of um, so many different nation states. And still today, they keep their tradition, their cuisine, character, et cetera, et cetera. So for all those reasons, I mean, I try to make that proviso as often as I can in the book, probably not enough, but it becomes a bit repetitive after a while. But it's a perfectly valid criticism that almost anything that I say in the book is probably not true of some part of, of Italy. I mean, on the question, the broader question, can you do a, a, um, a portrait of a country? I think you can do an impressionistic sketch or at the other extreme, a sort of statistical analysis, but only at a particular moment in time. And so books like mine do need to be updated every so often because what was true even in 2015 of Italy is not true in 2023. Absolutely. So, um, if we uh, coming out of that, I mean, as you're saying that there's a sort of everything that everything has its opposite, and it's a paradox inside a paradox when you start trying to look deeply at who the Italians are. Um, but I think key concepts which you um, raise early on in, include the the duality between Forbismo and Fesso, Forbo and Fesso. Furbo e Fesso, yes, mm. that's right. This would be uh, Furbitia. Um, it, 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 it was a distinction that was first made by an Italian writer, actually, not uh, long after the turn of the 19th, uh, 20th century, um, that uh, the Italians fall into these two groups. Um, and for those of you who, who not familiar with these terms. Um, Fesso is quite a rude term, I mean, means an idiot. Um, and so if you look at an English um, a dictionary, you don't get the sense, which is that uh, it includes lots of things that certainly a lot of British people would applaud. So, you know, a Fesso is somebody who pays his taxes on, on time, um, doesn't, you know, cross the road when there's a red light. Um, keeps to his or her side of the, the road, you know, when driving, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and um, the, the furbo is the exact opposite of that. It's somebody who is always looking for a way around the rules, uh, who gets by in life. And it's quite interesting that, you know, again, if you go back to an English-Italian uh, dictionary, uh, all the definitions of furbo are negative. So you get deceitful, sly, crafty, etc, etc. But that doesn't give you the full meaning either, because there is, as actually was said by my co-translator of, 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 of this book for Penguin Classic, um, there, there's a world of difference between essere furbo, which can actually attract a certain amount of admiration, you know, you, you, you're living off your wits, you get by. Um, and fare il furbo, which is, well, um, jumping a queue, for example. So 
you know, these are really, you're getting into very deep cultural territory there with those two concepts, uh, which perhaps grow out of Italian history. Um, you know, a country that has been ruled or a people that has been ruled so often in its, their existence by foreigners and to cultivate ways of getting around rules, getting around regulations and, and surviving. Indeed. And um, I'm going to quote one thing you said about this, which is um, another of these paradoxes, which is Italians generally won't obey the law, but they are slaves to convention. Yes, I, I think that that's a fascinating distinction, that if you make something into a law, you can guarantee that people will immediately start to try and find a way around it. There's actually a phrase in Italian about, you know, fatta la legge, uh, um, and I'm getting nods here from the Italians in the crowd, know very well what the end of that phrase is. Um, but um, when something is agreed among people in some magical osmotic way, then it, becomes something that you do not deviate from. Um, which brings us on to another paradox, which is how in a people of individualists, everybody does everything the same at the same time. But anyway, the, 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 um, uh, the, we've seen this with, I mentioned in the book, the, the example of the no smoking ban in restaurants and bars which when it was brought in, I remember the comment at the time in Italian newspapers and on Italian television, people said, no, nobody's going to obey this. Everybody will find a way around this. In fact, in 24 hours, it had just stopped. Um, I think we've had an even more striking example during the pandemic where Italians actually respected what they decided were pretty sensible rules, far more obediently than, amazingly, the Germans, um, uh, amazingly, the Dutch. And in those countries, which Italians think of as being much more law-abiding um, than Italy, people actually broke with those regulations much more often. There was a hilarious sort of example of somewhere between the two, which was when I was living here about 30 years ago, and, and um, there was a decree that everyone should start wearing seatbelts, um, which was considered to be a, um, a terrible uh, attack on individual freedom. And so some enterprising people around Rome started selling T-shirts with, yeah. with, with a seat belt printed across it. So, 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 so you could avoid being pulled over by the carabinieri without having to actually follow the law. Four bits more. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But an area where, where there's um, a very strict um, following a convention is really comes to the food for, oh, can't speak, really comes to the fore is in uh, La Tavola and everything that goes with that. Yes, indeed. There's a wonderful um, uh, example of this in a book written by Anna del Conte. Uh, about Italian cooking, about how she is talking to, I think it's in Puglia, with a, um, a, a cook, with a, with a woman who known for her excellent cooking. And um, she talks about a new way of doing a particular uh, dish. And she explains it in great detail. And at the end, the woman just says, noi non lo facciamo così. <laughs> and that just puts an end to any argument. We don't do it like that. And I think that's one of the, uh, the um, perhaps I didn't stress this enough in the book, but I think that one aspect of Italian social conservatism, which is very, very um, negative in some of its economic and political effects, is one area in which it's very positive is in the area of cuisine, because Italy has managed to conserve its cuisine. I've seen this over the over my lifetime so much better than uh, the, the the French cuisine. Um, 
which may remain at the Michelin star level an exemplar, but uh, has deteriorated so markedly at the level of the, what in fact Italy would be the Trattoria, Osteria, uh, and indeed in the home, I would say. And, and of course, um, La Tavola is really essential to another, another very important cultural and social um, fact of Italian life, which is La Familia, um, which I, I think is... Yes, and I think it has continued to hold families together um, more than in many other societies. But here again, you get into these paradoxes because I know from my personal experience that Italian families are not necessarily any more united or any less um, divided than families in any other country. And there have even been surveys that have indicated that um, Italians' attachment to family values might even be lower than in some other countries. Um, but at the same time, I think that these family bonds are very strong indeed. So people may argue like crazy, but uh, and, you know, not beyond speaking terms with their brother or sister or, or what have you. And yet when push comes to shove, they will often do more for members of the family than would be the norm in northern countries. There's, there's a wonderful um, uh, Australian comedian of um, uh, Calabrian descent, and he tells a joke about how um, uh, he meets uh, a friend of his who's uh, not of Italian descent, another Australian. And the, uh, the guy is obviously looking very upset and he asks him why. And he said, oh, it's terrible. It's my mother and my father. And every night at dinner, they row. And then, you know, my father goes out in the, you know, the backyard and he screams and he shouts and says, I can't take this woman any, any longer. And then she throws the crockery around. And he said, and I looked at him and I, what, what seems to be the problem? <laughs> There's nothing more to be said after that. But, but, but uh, related to the, the um, very strong sense of family and strong family bonds is also the, the, the wider community of the Campanilismo is famous. Is, is, is it, is there a sense of, of Italy and of being Italian, is that more developed than perhaps it used to be, do you think? I think it is. I think that more Italians feel Italian than before. Um, but I say that, as you can probably hear in my voice, very tentatively. I mean, there has been a resurgence of interest in and use of dialect by younger Italians in the last 20 years or so. Um, but at the same time, I think that the effect of intermarriage has been to create a more homogenous nation. I mean, it used to be true that the only time that Italians really felt Italian was when Italy was playing another country on the soccer pitch. And that, I think, is no longer true. I think people do have a stronger sense of the identity of the country and that, you know, if you've got a um, a Lombard father and a, a mother from Campania, you're, you're bound to feel more Italian probably than either Lombard or, or, or Neapolitan. Um, but having said that, you know, there are still strong pockets of resistance. Uh, and I would say that Florence is probably the, the, you know, the strongest of the lot. Um, and you still come, a lot of, come across a lot of Florentines who say that, um, you know, they are um, Florentine by, by, by profession, by vocation, you know, Tuscan with difficulty and Italians never. Um, and uh, there was a wonderful example recently of, of, of this attachment, um, which can often come by being counterposed somewhere else. So, you know, I mean, the, the, still, you know, the, the, the Sienese have never 
the given the the the, the, the sack of uh, Siena by the Florentines back in the what is it fifteenth century, um, and quite recently as part of what's known as the Uffizi Tifusi, um, the uh, director of this great museum here. Um, agreed to uh, some masterpieces being sent to Luca. And this was greeted by the mayor of Luca as a very generous gesture. And the next day, in one of the local papers, um, there were these letters saying, you know, why are we accepting this Florentine rubbish? You know, these, and these were you know, masterpieces of the Renaissance. Uh, uh, so these things go very deep, yeah. Certainly do. But I mean, it, to navigate your way through living in it, you have to have your connections, you have to have your network of people you know, um, otherwise you get balked by the dysfunction of much of the public sector systems. Um, so can you talk a little bit about why the, um, the, the and it's another, another paradox, another contrast between the um, extreme quality and efficiency of a lot of the small businesses and uh, a lot of the economic activity um, and the craziness of the bureau public bureaucracy and the red tape um, and the extreme lethargy of the courts and all these other things. What's going on there? Yeah, I mean, these are really historical problems. I mean, going back to the uh, adventures of Pinocchio, which I translated with an Italian, um, in there, this is a book written in 18, between 1881 and 18. 83, um, there is um, a, a, the incident in which um, a Pinocchio goes to court because uh, he um, has been robbed and he is sent to jail. Um, and he's sent to jail for the crime of being gullible. Um, and the judge who sends him to, to jail is an ape, by the way. Um, and then there's an amnesty, and he, he can't benefit from the amnesty because he's not actually committed a crime. It's only when he goes to the jailers and says, you know, I'm a crook as well, that they say, okay, well, then you can go. Now, um, so there's nothing new about, you know, Italian criticism of their, their legal and judicial system. Um, and unfortunately, it remains very, very slow. And slow justice is always bad justice. Uh, because and it, I think it's the, the root of a great deal of the worst kind of urbizia, because you know if you don't settle a debt, then um, it's very likely that on average, in fact, your um, um, your creditor is going to have to wait for around about seven or eight years to get a final judgment. Part of this is about scrupulousness, the fact that the three stages of judgment is so that uh, things don't go wrong, which is admirable. Um, but the problem is that it does abstract, obstruct society in lots and lots of um, important ways. Um, so I, I think that that, that, that is, is a very important um, reason why, I mean, one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, given by foreign investors who have decided not to invest in Italy. It is the shortcomings of the judicial system. Uh, and it's also, I would propose, um, one of the reasons why personal relationships become so important uh, in business and other things, because if there is um, no very effective recourse to law, uh, then you don't want to get into a relationship or uh, let alone a financial relationship with somebody you can't trust. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and it is, in fact, a very interesting example of this um, because what economists will tell you is that as nations develop uh, economically, uh, as they grow, um, trust grows in the society. They talk about high trust societies and low trust societies, and they broadly correspond to the more developed and less developed nations. Italy is the standout um, exception. It's a highly developed economy with a very low uh, level of, of trust, social trust. And 
Um, that lack of social trust is um, it partly um, explains it explains many in Italian society. One of them is the prevalence of organized crime, because as sacrilegious as it may sound to say it, the mafia, particularly in Sicily, has a social role. Um, it has a social function, which is that it guarantees the respect of contracts. You know, in a society where you're going to have to wait for nine years or whatever it is for the return of your money if somebody defaults, you need some kind of a guarantor. Um, that can be a notary. On Sicily, people prefer to go to a um, godfather uh, who will uh, say that I guarantee that the contract will be respected. Um, in the sense that, you know, if you don't pay, then you might come around and shoot off your decal. Um, and it explains many, many things, uh, I think, that lack of trust. Um, and it is definitely a drag on Italy's economic development. Fascinating. In a moment, I'm going to invite people in the room and indeed on the Zoom to um, come in with a comment or question on what we're talking about. But before we do that, I'm going to do one last one, um, which is to ask John. So we all, you know, one of the cliches of describing the Italians is the whole discourse around Bella Figura. But John, I'm going to ask you the question, what is Bella Figura actually all about? It's a much wider concept than most non-Italians understand. I think a lot of Italians believe it's just a matter of uh, looking good. And that is part of Bella Figura, but it's not by any means the whole of it. Um, an example that I often give is that, you know, if you're going to visit somebody who's invited you to a nice dinner, then you not only have to take um, a bottle of whiskey, but it's got to be a bottle of malt whiskey, and it's got to be a, a good malt whiskey, preferably 12 years old, and what's more, it's got to be nicely done up in a nice little package. And that's, that, that is Bella Figura. It's not just appearance, it's also the substance. And it's, it's a matter of not letting yourself down in front of the other person, which I think speaks to this strange mixture of superiority and inferiority that you find all the way through Italian society. That on the one hand, you know, Looking back to the past, you know, Italians quite rightly feel, my God, we gave the world the Roman Empire and the, the Renaissance um, and, and rightly feel very proud of those, those things. And yet there is this underlying sense of maybe and we're not quite good enough. And uh, you see that often in expressions that are more fitting of a small country than of a big and, and rich one. And I remember actually once interviewing uh, Giulio Tremonti, who was the uh, finance minister under Berlusconi, and he got quite upset about this at one point. He said, you know, people keep saying it is a poor country. It's not a poor bloody country. He said, it's a rich country. And I wish my compatriots would understand that. Um, but yet there is that feeling that, you know, maybe it's, it's not, this is not quite good enough and an obsessive repeating of what people have said abroad about Italy in newspapers, in the media, and what have you. Um, that, though, is changing. And I think that that is a sign of Italians becoming more self-confident. When I first knew Italy, I mean, almost everything that I wrote seemed to get relayed back to La Repubblica, Corriere la Sera, La Stampa, whatever, if not all three. Nowadays, that happens much less. I think it's a sign that Italy, it is a young country, and I think it has young country syndrome, is feeling more confident about itself. Okay, so now we'll give you guys a chance. If you're on the Zoom, um, we don't have a computer, we can't see you. So um, just unmute and talk and we'll hear you. Um, and we'll take one in the room first. Um, so, and then I will give the Zoomers a chance to speak to us. Um, I'm not going to run around with the microphone tonight. If you want to um, ask something, um, raise your hand and I'll point to you. And then you can speak in a loud voice and say what you want to say. So down the front here. Curious, 
do not reward servants with tips. And, and therefore, how does this impact them when they travel to foreign countries? Um, tipping is expected, accepted, and so on. We're here as um, right. I'll, I'll just repeat that for the Zoomers. So the question is, why do Italians not uh, tip and, and how does that affect their behavior when they travel? Yeah, I think the custom is just to leave a few speechulae, uh, you know, some small change on the table. It's because I'm not sure exactly when, because it's before my time as a correspondent here and after the time that I came here as a, as a, as a very young man. Um, at some point in the 70s, 80s, I think, um, a law was passed saying that service from now on was, um, as the, 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 the French would say, service compris, that it was included in the bill. And therefore, anything you left was therefore a, a genuine tip to the server. Um, how does it impact Italians abroad? Um, it causes uh, sometimes misunderstanding and resentment uh, in a society like in America, where you know twenty percent tips are not that uncommon, if people then you know leave like two percent, um, the other way round too can actually cause some amusing incidents. There was Mark Zuckerberg came over to Rome a few years ago, and he clearly been well briefed before he arrived. He went to a, a restaurant that I I know uh, in Rome. And at the end, he just left a few coins on the table. And as the lady just said in the front row, that didn't go down well. Ah, they complained bitterly to the newspapers in Rome uh, that he was one of the richest men in the world. He'd only left whatever it was, you know, 14 centesimi. Uh, and, um, but he was right. I mean, he got it right, frankly. Uh, actually, funny episode. Um, just last week, I was correctly told off by a friend when um, we a group of us went out for dinner and we left about, almost about ten percent. The reason I did it was it was made a round number for divvying up the bill, um, but it was culturally appropriate, so I apologise. <laughs> yeah, I'm just comment on this, but actually in Rome, anyway, taxi drivers will get quite grumpy if you give them too much. I mean, Absolutely. It's, 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 I don't know why this should be. Yes, they were actually, you know, uh, term nasty if you add on an extra. You, you, I found that I had to explain it. But I would say, well, you know, thank you, know, grazie per la tese, you know, thank you for waiting for me if they'd uh, waited at a particular point. Um, otherwise, um, no, they didn't like it, threw them out. You, you know, well, you can round up, but no more than that. Perhaps taken as being patronizing or I think implying right. superiority. I think that's right. And I think that Romans, particularly, are very sensitive to that. We talked about it earlier on about regional differences. That's a classic one. Um, Rome, you know, having been the capital of the old pontifical state, uh, you know, subject to an absolutely crushing hierarchy, so that, you know, you weren't just breaking the law, you were breaking God's law. Uh, you weren't just rebelling against the state, you were rebelling against God's vicar on earth. Uh, all of that has helped shape a, a mentality in Rome that uh, people do not like being, you know, talked down to, and they will often send up anybody who tries to do so. So, Zoomers, does anyone want to unmute and say something? I'll count down from five. Five, four, two, one. No Zoomers. But we've got one in the back of the room. Can you use a loud voice? The question was, um, are the Italians becoming more or less interested in the European Union? That is really one of the most, one of the trickiest areas because the polls keep on throwing up very different results according to the questions that get asked. The opinion polls, the opinion polls, yeah. Um, at the moment, I think that we've got a low point in Euro skepticism, which is kind of not surprising since Italy is going to get 
to or stands to get 200 billion euros from the European Union out of its post-pandemic recovery fund. Um, so I think it's at a low tide at the moment, but it has unquestionably got a lot higher since the introduction of the euro. And you get, for example, polls that show people who are very critical of the euro, but would not want to come out of the EU. Um, that has, again, also, I think, faded in the last few years, but it's an undercurrent. It is definitely an undercurrent. And I think that as the effect of that recovery fund works its way through, if it works its way through, um, then you will see perhaps that anti-European sentiment uh, receding even further. But one important consideration has been Brexit, because the Italians look across the channel, they see what's happened in Britain, they think, no, no way am I, are we going to go that way. <laughs> we got one at the very back. Sorry, yes, David. Towards China. Towards China, yeah. China. Um, I would say that the two probably don't link in very strongly, um, but it was certainly a more Eurosceptical government, which was the one uh, between 2000 and 1890, which was the Conte, the first Conte government, which embraced the so-called Belt and Road Initiative. And that could now be on that, that deal that was signed by Luigi Di Maio when he was foreign minister could now be undone because we have a government at the moment which is very keen to be seen to be conforming to the Western norm on support for Ukraine, and now to what's known as de-risking with regard to China. Um, just get a pause for one second to allow the Zoomers a chance to come in. If you want to talk, just unmute and talk and we'll hear you. Pause. Nope, okay, at the back of the room. Spaniards and Italians, we are often put in the same basket here in Southern European society. For me, as Italian, I feel we're very different from the Spaniards. So, is that also your impression? And what are the main differences in that? So, a, qu a question from an Italian in the audience was um, John wrote about the Spanish as well. So, what's the difference between the Spaniards and the Italians? Um, I, I agree with you. I think there is an enormous difference. I would say that it is um, as wide a difference as between, say, the British and the German. Um, they might seem superficially to be similar, um, but actually there are very big um, variations. Um, in fact, I've, I've known, um, it's quite amusing when you, you encounter Spaniards who've come over to live here, you know, at the beginning, first few weeks, they say, oh, you know, we, we'll get on here fine, we'll slip into the society. Um, uh, um, son uh, nuestros primos, you know, they're, they're our cousins, you know, we're, we're very similar, we're all Latin. Then you meet them, let's say, three, six months later, and they say, pero esta gente no está nada como nosotros, you know. They, they, they get it. Um, and uh, the, um, I think differences, I think there's a huge historical difference, which I kind of have alluded to beforehand, which is that Spain was a, an imperial country. 
and it has many of the ticks and reflexes of former imperialists. In that way, very, very similar, I think, to the British. Um, this has happened to me many times, that, um, at least a dozen times, in, certainly in Rome frequently, and quite recently here in Florence, that Spaniard will come up to you and ask you the way in Spanish, um, because everybody speaks Spanish, don't they? And, um, and then you reply in fluent Spanish, and they say, uh, muchas gracias, and they go off. And they, they don't say, you know, how on earth is it that I run into somebody who speaks fluent Spanish? Um, and they just take it for granted. Italians would never do that. Um, and I think that that comes from the fact that Italy has, is a young country. It's been united only since 1861. And before that, there is this long, tragic history of either foreign domination or foreign um, indirect influence on the um, peninsula. I mean, one of the things I mentioned in the book is that you know, armies of every nation have trampled over this peninsula, um, in, including a Russian one. Um, at different stages, different people have had excuses to come down here and cause havoc. I think it's one of the reasons why there's a strong streak of pacifism in the Italian people. Uh, because if you look back at their history, it's pretty, pretty awful, pretty, as, as ghastly as many in, in Eastern Europe. Um, and I think that that has made Italians, um, in that sense, very different from, 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 from the Spanish, who still, despite the fact that now it's a very different country from what it was in the, in the past, there is still a certain militaristic um, air in the country, um, which is um, in Spain, in Spain, not in in in, in Italy. Uh, so militaristic is perhaps putting it too strongly, but certainly military values. And also, I think another one first hit me in a book that I was reading by Norman Douglas when he is he had called Old Calabria, where he makes the point that. Um, he makes a point of arguing over the bill at the um, little pension where he's been staying. And he says the reason for that is that he knows that, um, he doesn't say in Italy, but he was talking specifically about the South, um, a man is judged by the care he takes of his money. Um, and I think that, that that is very true, that often Italians will regard you as a fesso, to go back to the earlier point, you know, if you don't bargain, if you are a bit too loose with money. In Spain, it's the opposite. Um, an Hidalgo, you know, doesn't care about small amounts. An Hidalgo is munificent. And in the poorest little shack in the middle of Estremadura, you'll have people just push back change to you across the counter as though this is of no accord to me. Um, I think that's a very fundamental difference between the two countries. Fascinating. Um, Michael, and then Claire. Alessandro said to me, Michael, please remember, in Florence, we have an important saying, not guilty, avere la sua fire. <laughs> I must have it. What the next?
a lot of Christians go, oh, it was a pity it didn't every night, it was a mistake that it was truly kept in the individual. I'll never forget that of that evening it was celebrated. You could not get into the center of the town of Florence. And you could not buy a piece of red, green, or um, white um, material. But it had all been bought up and converted into Italian flag. And the people marching around that town that were all young people. And there was no doubt they were feeling they are proud to be that. And thank heavens, Italy was united and didn't become a kind of Yugoslavia. And so it, it, it's, a, it's a very strong feeling. I think it's not unpleasant. In the face of those people who said you should never. Uh, for those on the Zoom who might not have heard that, Michael has shared a, a personal story of uh, being taught by his Florentine wife about Bella Figura when his old shabby jacket was consigned to the back of the wardrobe forever. Um, and then went on to talk about how on the uh, this 150th anniversary of the Italian uh, unification, there was a massive celebration in uh, Florence, um, particularly from amongst the young people. So. Italian identity is alive and well and growing. Claire. Could you speak a little bit about the ambivalence the Italians have to being foreign, to foreigners, um, in the sense that they love them and just at the same time, it's the economically and, you know, it's very good for the day for the economy. And yet, a certain sense that you will never ever integrate all that. Um, in a way, also you are sitting back for being taken, you know, for for a spin. Um, we we were doing that for half, and somebody said, "Okay, I need to make a little, you know, cartoon. Well, who should I make it up to?" And we said our name, and they said, "Oh no, that's far too difficult. I'll just write Spaniera." <laughs> so, Claire's uh, asking about the ambivalence Italians seem to have towards uh, the foreigners. Both liking them and liking the economic contribution, but fundamentally believing that they'll never really integrate and become part of the country. Yeah, I think that the the various things there to to unpack. I mean, starting with the factura, eh, with a language that is almost entirely phonetic. In, they've had to import an English word to describe spelling, lo spelling, right? Uh, because you don't need to spell in 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 um, Italian, and indeed, if I'm ever going out with somebody with an Italian name, whether they're Italian or not, I always use that name to book a table. Because if I try and use my own, I know that I get there and they won't have the table ready. You know, um, uh, the um, so um, yes, I think on the the business of what you might call the, the culture of the cult of la gallina da spenare, as they say, to the, the, the chicken to be plucked. Um, that comes back to this point of Giulio Tremonti, this idea that Italy is a poor country and the, therefore any foreigner who comes must, you know, um, by definition, be richer than they are. Um, and I think that also reflects, first of all, the fact that the poor days are very recent. I mean, if you look back to even the 1950s, 1960s, you know, Italy was a very, very different society in which people, you know, the vast majority of people were poorer than any given foreigner. I think secondly, the foreigners who came were richer. That's the other thing. You know, they could afford to travel. So that very much gave the impression that, you know, you went coming over, over to Portofino or um, where have you, then you, know, you they were richer than the average Italian. Um, on the question of integration, I mean, I think that when people join a family in Italy, there is the, the question of integration disappears, you, you, you are accepted. Um, I, I think that the 
the difficulty comes where somebody is, um, uh, you know, not a part of a family, but has lived here for quite a long time, speaks the language to a certain extent. Um, I think that that is the, the, the problem area. Um, and I think a lot of it does depend on language, um, but that's a personal theory of mine, which is that what used to be called racial discrimination is more a question that is oral than, than optical. I think people um, find it very difficult to discriminate against those who speak exactly like them. Now, very few foreigners are gonna be speaking exactly like an Italian, but if you get, what I found was that as I progressed in Rome anyway, um, there came a point where Italians made certain assumptions about you because of the way you spoke. And that they assumed, for example, that you knew the result of Roma, AS Roma's last, last match um, and would talk about even, even the cab drivers would, would do that. So it's not impossible to integrate to quite a, a, a degree. But the, the family, I think, is, is definitely a clincher, a trump card. Um, and um, I've noticed that some Italians to whom I am very close have tried to integrate me in a kind of odd proxy way into the family. Um, a, a very good Neapolitan male friend of mine refers to me as his uncle. And <laughs> the same is true of a young Florentine woman who was the girlfriend of somebody I knew and whom I, I got to know and um, like, and she liked me and, and, and started calling me again uh, her uncle. She appointed herself my uh, niece and there's nothing I can do about it, you know. And I'm, I'm reminded of birthdays and you know, I have to cough up and that kind of thing. I, I particularly want to hear some more from the Italians, because I, I think it's time for you to push back and say that uh, John and myself and other people in the room have got it all horribly wrong. <laughs> Anyone want to come, come and do something like that? Well, maybe we've got it right. <laughs> no, I'm not. Never right. get it right about the entire country. That's for sure. That, that's for sure. That, that, that's important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one, one from over there. Say Italiano or no? No. But you can ask a question anyhow in English. Or threatened, yeah, yeah. Can you, can you... Um, yes, the, sorry. If you want to sign oh, just with Zoomers, the question was um, whether the um, confidence, the increasing confidence of Italians, translated into the area of their management of the environment and specifically the urban environment. Um, it's an interesting thing. I mean. Um, I remember once writing an article for, I was asked to write an article for Corriere della Sera, and I, and I made the article about um, the urban environment in Rome and how uh, Rome was on the one hand, one of the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful capital in the world, but it was also a very ugly city. And you, know, you only have to, have to go out to the, what they call the periferia, and it's ghastly, I mean, it really is. Um, so, and I think that there is an, a tendency to feel that because the center of Naples, because the center of Venice, because the center of so many cities is so gorgeous, that, you know, we don't have to worry about the rest very much. Um, and I think that that is a, a, a yeah, very big problem. It's just almost a psychological problem, I would say. Um, another thing that I regret 
is the way in which in Italy, as in a number of European countries, the green cause has been identified so solidly with the left because it's caused a resentment or a reaction on the right. And the environmentalists, of whom um, I, you know, in the widest sense of that word, those of us who are concerned about the environment need the right as much as the left, if not more so. And that's a, this identification with the left is a strange concept for somebody who was brought up in Britain, where, you know, organizations like the Countryside Alliance are full of landowners who I'm sure vote Tory at every election. So that I think has hindered um, what could have been a lot of protection. I've noticed a big increase in recent years. This is not urban, more uh, rural in um, uh, concern for the protection of animals in Italy. In that area, Italians, I would say, are far ahead of their Spanish counterparts. And I've, I've noticed also that there is a, enough concern, uh, probably, well, that there is growing concern and not enough concern about the wider issue of, of climate change. Okay, I'm going to wrap by um, asking John to reflect a little bit about what's happening in Italy now. Um, just, I think, November, you were here giving a report card on uh, Georgia Maloney's first uh, couple of months. Um, but six months on, how is she doing? I think not a great deal has changed since then, in the sense that um, her policy has perhaps become clearer, which is to absolutely toe the Western line on Ukraine and on China, um, and to avoid any taint of Euroscepticism that could endanger that 200 billion, um, while at the same time um, satisfying her own constituency with a rigorously right-wing agenda. Um, and I think that the key question over the next um, year or so will be how much that gets noticed in Europe, because it's not that um, people in other European countries, which often have conservative governments, object to right-wing policies, but that some of the moves that she is making uh, or not making are in direct contraposition to what have been considered up until now as core European values. Um, and so I think that that's going to be the balancing act that she's going to have to perform over the months to come. Um, the other is has to do, to do with Ukraine. I mean, the support for the uh, very material support that um, Italian governments, Draghi's and then Meloni's have given to Ukraine is extremely fragile. And um, it is the area in which she is most vulnerable to attacks from the opposition and indeed from within her own uh, coalition. I think that, that is the other joker in the if you like, over the next few, um, um, over the next year or so. And um, how well is the Italian economy going now? And how is it going, do you think, in the next year or two? Well, for a start, better than Britain's. <laughs> um, the a recovery is um, um, has been quite surprisingly strong in Italy, um, though that is partly a statistical um, phenomenon because they're coming up from a lower basis having been hit particularly hard during the pandemic. Um, I would say that um, the big risk, um, as people in the city like to say, going forward, uh, is the, the combination of high debt with high 
interest rates. Um, and there have been a, there's been a lot of squealing from government ministers and from Maloney herself about the European Central Bank's determination to get the inflation down by pushing up interest rates rapidly and um, in pretty big steps. Um, their argument is going to be, we cannot live with inflation at this level and it's not all to do with energy. Um, but having said that, um, the Italian response is that yes, but you know we've got damn near 150% of our GDP in debt. And if you keep on pushing up those interest rates, it narrows our uh, room for maneuver because so much of our spending has to go on paying back the interest. That effect hasn't really yet kicked in because not enough Italian debt has yet been auctioned at the higher prices to pull up the average, but it's coming. And um, unless we see a peak in these interest rates, I would say within the next six months, uh, Italy is going to get itself into uh, some, some difficulty um, or could get itself into some difficulty. At the moment, the marks at markets are holding steady. Um, they're not panicking. Um, and uh, rather conformist uh, policies abroad, I think, are actually helping. Them. And um, are they doing a good job with the uh, um, recovery fund? Uh, so far, so far, it's difficult to be absolutely categoric about it. But right now, the European Union is still, the European Commission is still sitting on the money that should have been paid after December. It's the tranche that Italy applied for in December and which should have been doled out at the end of March. Now, one of the reasons um, which has been resolved uh, was that there are a couple of what they regard as inappropriate projects one of which was in Florence, which was to use money for the um, improvement of derelict areas of the city to do up the Serie A um, soccer stadium in Campo di Marte, which is by any uh, standards not um, a degraded area as the, um, this was, sorry, we're going back to Furbizio, of course, here. Um, um, now, um, and there are other problems, so there are other problems. Um, and I think the, the, the longer term issue is whether Italy has the administrative capacity to uh, define the projects on which this money is going to be spent and to give assurances to Brussels that it is going to be properly project managed because there is a huge problem within the local and regional administration of Italy, which is um, a short, well, a, a surplus of lawyers, um, surprise, surprise, and a shortage of project managers, surveyors, engineers, etc. people who can do this kind of work. There was a um, very interesting article written by a La Repubblica, uh, reporter who was uh, freed for a week to go off around the south of Italy. And he found quite a large town in the south where the uh, equivalent, what in Britain would be called the borough surveyor, the person, key person for implementation of any project, you know, had actually left school at 15 with a high school diploma. And that unfortunately is that's an extreme example, but there are many understaffed departments, particularly in the Mezzogiorno, south of, and the islands, um, where there just is not the capacity to do what um, Brussels expects of um, Italy. And I think that one of the risks of this recovery fund is that because in the north people can spend this money, then um, it could actually end up widening the north-south gap. Um, 
the um, I remember, in fact, speaking to uh, somebody in the Comune here in Florence, and uh, this was when the money was first um, given in theory, before it was actually handed out. And he said, we are uh, sitting around scratching our heads, trying to think what on earth we can spend all this money on. And then he, after a pause, he said, now you can imagine what's going on down in Cosenza. Um, and I think that that is a big problem uh, for the future. My, my, my last one, and then unless anyone's got an urgent uh, question or comment, we'll, we'll, we'll come to the end of the evening. Um, it, this will kind of tries to tie, the attempt to tie the two pieces together. One of the things that comes through in your book, the Italians, is an essential cultural conservatism in this country. It's very noticeable. When I listen to Raitre on the way home, um, the cultural discourse is nearly always about what happened 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, very rarely about um, contemporary stuff. And so um, it seems that it's not a particularly likely situation that um, Georgia Maloney will choose to launch a culture war because <laughs> there isn't uh, much to fight a cultural war against. It's a provocative statement, but do, do you agree with that? Um, I think she is still capable of that um, in the widest sense of culture, because I think her ideas have changed, to be honest. I think that she still believes the things that she's always believed, but realizes that she cannot implement many of those policies without running grave risks for Italy. Um, uh, on the, if you like, the narrow de definition of culture as in the arts, I don't think we're going to see much of a change of that. If anything, I would think we're going to see a retrogression under um, Meloni um, and her ministers. I think that they are cultural conservatives who will not want to see too much experimentation. And there have even been rumors, for example, that the extremely successful experiment of bringing in from outside uh, curators and directors of museums uh, and of uh, archeological sites, um, uh, that, that might be reversed under a policy of Italians first. Um, and uh, I think that we, Italy was, in fact, I think just starting to tread a more interesting line. And I think it's a great pity if that cultural conservatism uh, begins to take hold again. Um, going back to an earlier question from one of the Italian um, members of our audience, I think that has been over the last 30, 40 years, a big difference between uh, Italy and, and Spain. Um, I rem remember it, uh, Spain in the 1980s. Um, there was a moment that bore out a theory that I've, I've developed, which is that countries that want to change embrace contemporary art. And um, I saw that very tangibly in Spain, where from one year to the next, the leading art exhibition um, went from being a minority interest to being flooded with visitors. And suddenly people were into um, contemporary art. And it's very difficult, even though there are very good Italian artists at work, um, to find you know, the Italian in the street who can tell you the names of more than two or three contemporary artists. Um, and there's a complete um, uh, uh, contrast between, on the one hand, the excellence of the art being produced in Italy, um, which is recognized outside Italy, and the perception inside. I remember Years ago, um, this must go back to about 2005, six, that one of the leading art magazines in the world 
put an Italian, Maurizio Catalan, at number two on a ranking of the most influential figures in the world at a time when I'm sure that not one in a hundred people in the street would know uh, his name. He was a major, and still is, major conceptual. Well, we could go on with this uh, conversation all night, but um, rules are that we've had our allotted time. Um, two things will now happen, well, three things, um, um, in order of descending importance. Um, through in the other room, we will have a glass of wine, Frescobaldi, our, our wine partners for this season, so the wine is pretty good. Um, John will not, we brought a glass of wine, but won't go through because he'll be here to um, sign books if you want to buy them, I think both the Italians we've been discussing, and also his definitively good translation of Pinocchio, which if you don't know Pinocchio beyond Walt Disney, I strongly recommend you. It's um, got nothing- Mine to... and my collaborators. Yes. I have to give her- To Anna, yes. 50% of the yes. credit. And royalties. <laughs> and indeed the royalties. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, the, the third thing that this up to, to do, which I'm sure you'll appreciate, is to thank John very much for his time. Okay.